Okay. Um, I welcome members to the ninth meeting in 2015 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee and, as usual, remind everyone to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. Our first item uh, today for the committee to agree to take uh, agenda item five in private. This, is, uh, this item is the consideration of a complaint against a cross-party group. Do members agree to take this in private? Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> We're agreed. Second item uh, today is for the committee to take evidence or, on its inquiry into the election of committee conveners. Uh, we have today with us uh, <coughs> Uh, what I might reasonably describe as two old lags from the Parliament uh, who have uh, both been ministers, committee conveners and members and therefore hopefully will have some good things to say to us. Hugh Henry and Michael Russell, thank you very much for coming and giving up your time uh, to help us uh, in our uh, deliberations. Um, now, the way I uh, normally conduct this is to go straight to questions. Uh, at the end... Uh, I'll provide an opportunity for each of you to, at short length, uh, perhaps provide us with any further comments you wish to make that haven't otherwise been covered in the questioning. That seems to work uh, for us uh, quite well. Right, I'll kick off the questioning. Um, most of the questions are probably fairly obvious, um, and, and do feel free to expand on the answers beyond what might appear to be the remit of the question, because we're, we genuinely want to try and tap into as much as possible. Anyway, let me start by saying would elected conveners enhance power sharing and accountability between members, the Parliament, the Scottish Government and the people who elect us? Who wants to start? Oh. Um, well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I think in, in theory you, you could argue that. Whether it would do so in practice uh, is debatable. I had floated the idea of elected conveners uh, I think in late 2010, um, and I think as I said in my submission to you, Convener, um, I, I've actually changed my mind. Um, I, I'm not so sure now. Um, I still think that the, the principle is, is a sound one. But in actual fact, I'm not sure that you could look at that change in isolation from other changes that uh, this Parliament would need to make. My starting point for any debate um, is actually about enhancing and strengthening Parliament, its status, its standing, um, and its effectiveness. Um, and I think there's, there's a different argument about Parliament from arguments about government and the role of government. And indeed, there's a different argument about Parliament from party politics. Um, you know, I've always had a view that whatever job I, I had to do, I would try and do it as effectively as I could. So when I was a minister, I did it on you know behalf of the the first minister that appointed me. Um, I realised it was a party political aspect, and I did that. But when I became a, a convener of a committee, um, frankly, my first responsibility was then to Parliament uh, and, and not to either the, the, the party or or indeed the the government, and I've been a committee convener both under um, a Labour-led government and under an SNP administration. So my job is, is on behalf of Parliament, and, and it's to Parliament. Um, I think that, and without straying into a wider debate convener, but th there are issues, for example, about the number of committees that we have, about the size of, of our committees to be able to um, be effective and robust. Um, I think there are constraints uh, in relation to the size of the Parliament um, that actually has some limitations, not, not just on uh, the committees, but on whether we, we, we elect our convener. And I suppose um, you could argue that, that there are debates to be had about whether the Public Audit Committee um, should be the only committee uh, in the Parliament that has a non-government uh, convener. Indeed, you might want to think out of the box and, and, and consider whether, irrespective of the political composition of the, the Parliament, whether um, certain committees might have a non-government majority, um, because without having a second chamber to hold um, the government to account, 
I think we need to find other ways of revising, um, checking, constraining uh, and reconsidering. So all of those things um, need to be considered. And I think finally, um, and I'll just say to, to George Adam on the way in, um, we should also reflect and realise that in historical terms, we're still a relatively young parliament. We are still developing, still maturing. And I think, um, I think we need more time to be able to develop um, robust approaches where, you know, I, I'm not saying we want to ape and mimic Westminster, but there we have a, a larger parliament with a longer history where, in committee terms, um, the committees can develop a, a degree of independence from the government of the day. So, uh, you know, I think all of that really needs to come into the mix, and it would probably be a mistake just to look at one facet in, in isolation. I was particularly interested when you said uh, government shouldn't have majorities in the committee. When I was Transport, Infrastructure and Climate Change uh, Minister, my committee had two out of the seven were government members and the convener wasn't. That was quite interesting, I'll merely say, but, but, but could be made to work. Mr. Russell. Yeah. I mean, I think to go back to your original question, the answer is I'm very much in sympathy with what Hugh has said, but I believe that elected conveners would be a good start to a process of change. They won't automatically have the results that you, in, you suggested they might have in, in your opening question. Uh, I think they would have to be part of a wider process of reform. But I'm very much with James Mitchell in the evidence he gave, the oral evidence he gave to you, I think, last month. And I'd like to quote it if I might, because I was very struck about it, because I think it's exactly the position I, I take on this. Um, he says, I, I'm not sure sure it's an elastoplast, but it could conceivably be a catalyst, that is a question of elected conveners. It could contribute to a next stage. I don't think that it would undermine the next stage in any overall review. I'd be very much in favour of a review. The Parliament has been pretty good at looking at itself periodically. It would be good if there was a major review in which the Parliament asked itself how it should go forward, particularly in the light of an increase in powers. But elective conveners would be a catalyst. It would be a good base on which to look for the broader question. Um, I think undoubtedly this Parliament will have increased powers of some sort within you know, after, probably after 2016 and that election. Uh, it is, I think, inconceivable that the number of uh, MSPs will increase. I just think that uh, debate is not going to take place and certainly not in a way that would result in an increased number of members. So how do you cope with the increasing work with committee, a committee system that's already somewhat strained and a committee system, as I said in, in my letter to you, convener, that I very much see now, uh, you know, having had the experience of it in the last six months but not having been part of it since 2003, I very much see it, it's um, under-resourced in the sense of having an equity of arms when you come to things like legislation and amending legislation. So there needs to be a, a reorganisation and review of the committee system, the way in which the parliament functions, to put the committee system back at the heart of that process. And I think yes, Hugh and I would be pretty much agreed on that. The question is, where do you start and how do you get it moving? And it seems to me if you reject this one, then you're still you're casting around for the first step. If you accept this as the first step, and it can be made to work, I don't think the, the issue of the number of MS, MSPs is particularly germane, and I thought Alan Beath's uh, approach to that was quite helpful, then if you can get this in place, it should be the first step of a wider review, which this committee and the entire parliament should be engaged in. Can I just go back to Hugh Henry then, and partly in the light of uh, what Mike Russell has said. Um, you've changed your mind, and that's a perfectly respectable thing to do. Um, is part of what is moved you to a different position when you engage in the detail of how such a change would affect other things? In other words, is it, is it that you've, you've changed your mind about whether it might be a good idea or not, or is it when you look at the detail of how it might, might work that you, you're confronted with some difficulties that I think it's fair to say the committee uh, in its discussion so far has been engaging with? No, I haven't changed my mind about the principle. I, I, I still think... Uh, ultimately, um, that's something that, uh, that, that we should consider, we should aspire to. It, it, it's more about the practicalities. Um, you know, for example, what would you do uh, if you had a situation where um, a majority party 
um, decided that, irrespective of it being, or notwithstanding it being a, a private vote, took a decision at the group meeting and whipped members to back uh, a certain person in uh, an opposition party to be the convener. There could be a danger that a majority party could decide that, you know, for example, if um, you know if someone like Christine Graham um, w w was a contender for uh, Justice Committee and it wasn't the SNP who were in government, then you, you could find the danger that a majority party would say, well, actually, do you know something? If we're anticipating um, a rough ride with controversial legislation, the last thing we want is a robust and effective uh, convener. And, and that danger would actually undermine uh, Parliament if you were able to influence um, having a convener that was not necessarily the best, the most effective uh, or the most robust. And I suppose it then would bring you back to the debate that if, if you are going to consider an elected convener, um, then perhaps government ministers shouldn't have a, a vote in the process because the, the function and purpose of the committees is to hold the government of the day to account, particularly uh, when it comes to, to legislation. Do you want to come in? Can I, could, could I just say something in terms of, of what Hughes just said? Because it seems to me if the criticism of elected conveners was that they could be influenced by the whips, then the worst, if that's the worst criticism of elected conveners, then it is no worse than the present situation. Because we know the present situation is, is, is a, a creature of patronage. I'm not criticising it, but it's a creature of patronage and decisions are made uh, you know, by political parties. So if that is possibly the worst thing that could happen, then we need to look to see if there are any opportunities and advantages. And I think there are several that you can have, particularly in the development of a, a, a leadership role from people who may not uh, wish to see their career in any other way. So, I mean, Christine Graham became a convener. We shouldn't use an example. You said somebody like Christine Graham. There's nobody like Christine Graham. <laughs> but uh, but you know, she became a convener in the existing system. And indeed, talking to her yesterday, she's been a convener for all but two years of the life of this parliament. So, you know, people who have a, a different approach to this, perhaps a more radical approach to this, can emerge through the present system. Perhaps we could get more of them to emerge, but we could also develop a type of leadership which owes and, and is loyal to, as you said, the Parliament itself, and, and the way in which the Parliament can develop. Can, can, I, can I maybe just take my, Michael up? Can, on, I, can I just <laughs> become a debate? Say, say, well, that's precisely what I want to say. Right. Uh, let, um, let's speak through the chair and uh, sure. um, by all means respond to each other, but yeah. through uh, the chair, uh, please. Can you not, the, the, the point that Michael makes um, about we would be no worse off than where we are just now uh, isn't entirely correct because... Um, what we have at the moment is the political parties through the, 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 their own internal system deciding who they think would be the best person for that job, whether from an opposition perspective or from uh, a government perspective. It would be entirely different if the majority party were able to determine, for example, in the present circumstances, who the Labour convener was or who the Conservative convener was or who the... I don't know if the Liberal Democrats have of have, have anyone, but um, you know who, who conveners of other parties were, um, rather than the, the, their own party. Because at the moment, opposition parties will pick people who they think will do an effective job in holding the government to account. That's different from the majority party deciding which of the opposition politicians they want to choose to hold government to account. So there is a there is a slight difference. Yeah, are you? Attempting, uh, Mr. Henry, to lead us to the idea that were we to have elected conveners, there should be an element required in the process of cross-party support for the appointment of a convener. Is, is, is that where you're taking us? But not necessarily to the extent that would allow a single party to effectively veto the appointment of a convener. Yeah, that, that, that could be one way of doing it. Uh, I've already suggested that if you were to do that, then another way might be to ensure that government ministers don't have a, a vote. But the problem is that you then start to get in, you know, to the scenario that, that you present, you start to get into fairly cumbersome uh, procedural issues um, that, that might actually obviate the, 
the secret ballot that, that, that has been suggested. So it's not, it's not necessarily a, an easy thing uh, to do. Patricia? Uh, good morning. morning. Uh, Hugh Henry mentioned that uh, perhaps, if I understood him correctly, that perhaps ministers shouldn't take part in the voting for conveners. At Westminster, our understanding is that uh, ministers whose committees, or, or rather whose departments are scrutinised by a committee, do not take part in the election of the convener for that particular committee. But of course our system is quite different because our, dep our ministerial departments do not reflect absolutely the remits of the committees. So you could have a minister who answered, if you like, or was scrutinised by three or four committees possibly, which would make the system quite complicated potentially or would you just exclude ministers altogether from the election of conveners? It's just not my starting point um, as, a, you know, as, a, as a preferred method but if the, if the committee were to look at that or parliament were to look at that then I, I would suggest that perhaps all ministers uh, should be excluded because we actually and I come back to the point I made earlier on we, are, we have a relatively small parliament um, and, and that then distorts um, the, the, the balance quite, quite easily and, and the point that Patricia Ferguson rightly makes um, is the, the cross-cutting nature of some of the ministerial portfolios um, would, would mean that uh, you couldn't have a, a precise identification with just one committee. I mean, I think it's perfectly possible to devise a, a set of rules for this election as it's possible to devise a set of rules for any election. You know, you don't, you don't fail to have elections because the rules are complicated. You have the rules that suit the election. And I think there is a strong argument for uh, excluding ministers in these circumstances. I think you're quite right that in the Westminster situation it's different. Uh, it is a voluntary convention, as I understand it, at Westminster. It's not part of the rule, but there is a convention that ministers don't... I think it's perfectly feasible here to simply say ministers would not get a vote. Uh, given the number of ministers involved, that doesn't take a huge number. 16 to 18 takes out of 100... If you take the presiding officer out, out of 128, that would leave you a pool of about 110 votes. And I think that's perfectly feasible. And, yeah. Sorry, I, I wasn't finished. Yeah, I, I'm not quite finished. And um, what about parliamentary liaison officers, for example, who clearly um, do a job on behalf of government, um, but who are technically backbenchers, but clearly have the interests of the minister for whom they work? Uh, very much at the forefront of their minds. I always found that my parliamentary liaison officer had my interests at heart, particularly as he's sitting next to you. Um, I, I, think because, I think because they are not paid, and they're formally not paid, you have to draw a line somewhere. My own view is that they should be allowed to vote. You know, there will be members who have all sorts of uh, affiliations, you know. I mean, would you, if somebody was married to a minister, would you not have them vote? I think you've got to, got to draw a line somewhere. But ministers certainly... I think probably should be excluded. But that's a debate to be had. You know, I mean, the other debate to had is once you've done this, you, know, you would want to look at smaller and fewer committees, I'm pretty sure, because you're not going to be electing 15 or 20 people. You're probably, because of the nature of the parliament, the fact that I think the other thing we can learn from Westminster is that sitting on a single committee and building expertise as part of that committee is much preferable to circumstances in which people sit on two or three committees. And I think we have, we have stretched people too thinly, uh, and therefore I think we have to look at that. Mr. the parliamentary liaison officer's point? I think it's an interesting one, because notwithstanding that the, they aren't paid, as Michael Russell has, has said, um, they nevertheless have a, a government loyalty and responsibility and, uh, and are privy um, to, to decisions that the other MSPs wouldn't be. So, yeah, I, I do think that there is a, a potential conflict uh, there um, that, that would need to be considered. Can, can I just say, as convener, I suspect there would be no parliamentary liaison officers at the time of the initial election in any event. Um, you know, it would only be in by-elections guilt. <laughs> just back to the... Uh, the point that Hugh Henry made, uh, uh, you know, I listened very carefully to the prospect of a party uh, using uh, their votes because of majority. 
to appoint a particular convener that might be to someone else's advantage. Conversely, if um, the government uh, uh, ministers were not allowed to vote, and since this is such a small parliament, that you would actually, in the numbers right now, you would shift the, that majority on to another party because they would have a majority. I, you know, so, you know, I, 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 because of the small numbers, uh, I, you know, I, how, how do you overcome this? Because, you know, the one democratic thing you can say about this parliament, it's elected by the people, uh, you know, by a, a system that's, you know, more democratic. So, <coughs> so if you if you're going to exclude folk, you're just shifting one. Uh, if the principle that you state, uh, and I, I listen very carefully to, it, I, I think it's a strong one, but you would just shift it to another block, wouldn't you? There is that danger, um, but I also think that um, it comes back to to the issue about the difference between government and parliament and to whom you're responsible um, and where the primacy of your responsibility and loyalties lie. Um, so, you know, the remaining non-government um, MSPs, um, irrespective of party, if you accept the principle that there should be direct uh, elections by MSPs for, for convener, then would be forced to look at their responsibility to Parliament uh, rather than to government. Now, it's actually not an argument that I'm advancing because I'm not the one that's making the, the, the proposition, but at least in, in those circumstances um, you would hope that as the Parliament matures and develops that the remaining uh, MSPs would see that their responsibility for at least that function is to Parliament and not to party. But again, in a small Parliament, that there is a potential problem. We have actually seen this demonstrated in this Parliament on one occasion. Um, and it's perhaps illustrative just to remember that. Um, you know, in the election of the, a by-election for a deputy presiding officer, uh, where there were two uh, respected candidates, but one of them undoubtedly had the backing of the, gov the government of the day, that person was not elected. And they were not elected because there was a secret ballot that took place and the Parliament made a decision, quite a clear decision I seem to remember, that it wanted uh, another candidate. Once you have a secret ballot, then the power of the whips in this matter, if there were to be the power of the whips established, and I'm, you know, I think it's unlikely, the power of whips uh, very much evaporates. Uh, as long as you can't identify who you voted for, then you can vote for who you want. I think the Parliament has shown itself, when it's had the opportunity to do this, to be very thoughtful about what it thinks is best for the Parliament. And I don't think this would be any different. Dave Thompson. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Uh, <coughs> I find this very, very interesting. And I just want to touch on a point that uh, Mike Russell made, because I, I think it's... It's very valid and relevant in relation to the discussion about election of conveners, and uh, that is the, the number of committees and the size of committees and so on. <clears throat> I think it is important that that be looked at, and I was very interested to read the presiding officer's speech recently about that very subject and reducing the number of committees. And the issue of MSPs being stretched, that's been a problem for some considerable time, it doesn't help us to run this parliament. It doesn't help us to have good debates. It doesn't help us to run committees well. And I think if we're... I mean, it may well be... Yes, well, I have to set the scene, I think, convener. Otherwise, the members won't know what I'm, why I'm asking what I'm, I'm asking. And it goes back to the point, although Mike believes that there's no chance at all of more MSPs, I think it's a nettle that this Parliament's going to have to grasp, and it would help us deal with committees, it would help us to deal with business. I think there will be an opportunity when the number of MPs reduces, as it will, because the, the bill will be reintroduced in, the bound, re, uh, reintroduced in the boundaries, so we'll go down to 50, and I think a modest increase in the number of MSPs at that time, because of the reduction in MPs, and also because of the new powers, would be a very, very sensible thing for us to do. 
that then helps us to cope with some of the other difficulties. I think some of those difficulties would go if we had more members. So, well, I just wonder what the members' views are on that point. <laughs> I, uh, I think the likely... I mean, you know, I can understand where Mr Thompson is coming from, but I think the likelihood of there being any increase in numbers is remote to, the, to, a, to a vanishing point. I, I just don't think that will take place. The only argument that might bear scrutiny on that outside this building would be the argument of a transfer to another system of proportional representation, actually to probably to single transferable vote. If you did that in order to get manageable sizes of constituencies, multi-member constituencies, if there were to be that, then you would probably have to increase the number of MSPs. I was a member of the Arbuthnot Commission on, on, on Boundaries and Voting Systems, and that's why I have that arcane bit of knowledge. And I think the, no, the number then becomes 200 uh, to make that work. I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, certainly not in my lifetime. I doubt in the lifetime of anybody in this room or beyond it. So assuming we have 129 members, um, how do we make the best use of those 129 members and to make things practical for them and effective for them? Now, I mean, you know, Hugh and I have both been ministers. We know the information resource that ministers can draw. You know, when you go to a committee, particularly if you're proposing legislation, uh, the convener knows this too, you go well armed. You know, you have a great deal of information. Moreover, the work you do, the fact that you are absolutely steeped in the work of your department, you see vast volumes of paper every single day, you know, you know this subject or you should know this subject inside out. You really need to really resource a committee and each individual member of the committee dealing with that minister in the same sort of way. You have to give them the opportunity to, to get really immersed in their subject. And I don't believe if you stretch members over two or three committees, they have that opportunity. I also don't believe, with the best will in the world, and it's not a criticism of the Parliament, that the present resourcing of the, the committees that the Parliament is able to do allows that to happen. I mean, you have to add, for example, in the legislative process, you would have to add some very sophisticated legal advice to the committees about the technicalities of legislation in order to let them compete in anything like, on anything like a level playing field with ministers when they come with legislation, particularly at a stage two where you go into the absolute detail of that legislation. So I think we need to resource those committees better. I think we need to reduce the number of committees. I don't think we need to mirror... Uh, exactly each ministerial portfolio, they change all the time. I mean, we've just seen another set of changes last year. So perhaps broadly based subject committees with a limited membership, every member of the parliament being on one of those, and those committees with the resource of the parliament uh, being built up and developed, would I think give a higher level of scrutiny. And I think the development of people who chair those committees, who are elected by the parliament to chair those committees, as a, a cadre of, of chairs within the parliament. And incidentally, in your opening remark, you said that we'd both been committee chairs. I've never been a committee chair. I, I aspire, of course, to, to, to that height, but I've never been a committee chair. In those circumstances, I think you will have a better functioning parliament. It will take some working for. It's not, it's not easy. It'll take some working for, but it could be achieved. And I think the academics who gave evidence were right. I think this parliament was in advance of that uh, process when it started. I think it's now a little bit behind it. And I think you need to get in front of it again and the new powers and these changes could make that happen. Just a very quick point, convener. What would Mr Russell's uh, view be on the, on the point that uh, if you ask all the committee conveners, I'm just now, or most of them, workload, the workload of committees, they would argue, is massive and they can't cope with it at present. How would fewer committees deal with that point? Well, I think the two is one is I think one should take a very long, careful look at, at that workload, some of which is imposed upon it from, by government, and perhaps we could deal with that in a different way. But secondly, if a committee, each member was a member of only one committee, then those committees, some of those would meet more regularly. You know, I mean, uh, the, your committee meets every twice a month? Two weeks. Uh, once every two weeks. Some committees meet every week. I think you'd find that the committee would settle into probably a better pattern of work and also perhaps a more manageable pattern. One thing I find certainly in rural affairs, and we've discussed it as members of the Rural Affairs Committee, so I'm not giving any secrets away here, is when you go to your third hour of a committee meeting you know, and you've got a second panel of people who you're questioning, I don't think you're operating at absolutely your most effective. Um, so I think then we can manage that work better.
I appeared in front of uh, one of the committees of the Doyle, a joint committee between Senate and, uh, and they were taking three days of back-to-back -back evidence. And I was on the second day and I think the member is absolutely spot on. Mr Henry. Uh, a number of things that, that Dave Thompson raised, that I think, on the question of more members, I agree with uh, Michael Russell. I don't think that's a, a realistic prospect and it would be a diversion from uh, the the, the main debate. Um, on the, the issue of the number of committees, um, I, again, I had raised the, the prospect of a reduction in committee numbers four and a half years ago, um, and also about the way that committees operate. Um, I've always had a, a, a slightly different view from many other of my, my, my colleagues about restricting uh, committees only to when Parliament's not sitting. Uh, I really don't see um, the problem yeah. in allowing committees that are doing quite intense um, pieces of work to, to meet while Parliament is, is, is sitting. So I, I think that, that there are issues there. Um, Michael Russell's absolutely right about the resourcing of, of committees. You know, frankly, from a, a government minister's perspective, not all the time, but sometimes it can be quite easy when you're sitting there with all the facts, with all the support, with all the research, and you're up against people who are struggling to get that information, um, who are not resourced or equipped, where we have the backup of a hard-pressed uh, parliamentary support resource that isn't staffed or, 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 or serviced in nearly the same way as government, that becomes sometimes quite a one-sided um, argument and debate. And, and, and I agree um, about the, 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 the issue of people serving um, probably in one committee and specialising. Um, when the Parliament was established in 1999, I was a committee convener and I was also a member for a time of the Health Committee. And as members will know, uh, the Health Committee is a busy committee, looks at very uh, detailed issues. You're um, dealing with a, a, a range of, of, of organisations and people who are, who are immersed in their profession, who have knowledge and expertise the like of which none of us could aspire to about those specific topics. And to try to convene and be responsible for a committee and at the same time play a full role in a major subject committee, trying to not just hold the government to account but also try to do justice to the, the aspirations and views of, of public participants in the committee process it is very, very difficult uh, and, and I actually think does a disservice to the committee system, so I agree entirely with that, that view. Uh, just before I bring Patricia and Hugh Henry correctly referred to timings and committees and the fact we can't overlap with Parliament, we are under the caution in that respect today and um, let's step the pace up a little bit and concise expression of questions and answers. Patricia. Thank you, Convener. This point is not germane to the subject we're discussing today, but we, we have ranged a little bit already, I think, in our questioning. Um, and I, I accept entirely the arguments that colleagues are making uh, about the, the resourcing of committees and the resourcing of members and about the number of committees. But I, I do wonder, both uh, witnesses have been at pains to point out that there is, um, shall we say, less than an equality of arms between a minister coming to committee in terms of resource and the committee itself. Would that not actually be an argument for government of whatever complexion? Um, and, you know, I, I do speak from some experience of that myself, um, actually being more open and sharing more with the committees in the first instance so that there is less uh, of uh, a, a need for uh, some of the processes that we have to go through. I have to say that you know, my own experience of this has been a, 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 not only a willingness to share, but in recent months, for example, dealing with both... Um, 
uh, in, in McLeod and Marco Biaggi on the Community Empowerment Bill, they've been very willing to share. I, I don't recognise a, a lack of willingness to share, but they can't do a, a, a brain dump of everything that they know about their subject. It's important that the committee develops its own knowledge and its own expertise in order to be able to hold government to account and, you know, as Hugh rightly has said, uh, to contribute to a debate which is often dominated by professionals who have worked in that area all their lives. You know, it's quite daunting for a member, you know, a member, a minister, uh, let alone a member of a committee, to suddenly find yourself trying to question, trying to hold to account, trying to discuss things with people who know immeasurably more about a subject. And you know, it's just not possible for members to develop that knowledge, but it would be easier for them to try if they weren't trying to do it in two or three different areas. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I don't think it's necessarily about an unwillingness to share. It's about the volume of... Uh, information that you have access to and the staff who are able to marshal that into um, appropriate functions and sections um, you know you, you have people who you could as a minister say I, I'd like you to go and do this this and this and it will be there and they've read and they have helped you to prepare lines whereas if you're sitting as a committee member, and I know this both as a, a convener and an ordinary committee member, you have your own limited constituency resource, um, often overburdened by casework. Then you have a limited parliamentary resource, and, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful no, way. Uh, a, an expert one, a very good one, yeah. but nevertheless a very limited one that can't devote its attention to the specific things that you want to pursue and to be able to research that for you um, with the same turnaround um, that uh, a ministerial team could do. So it is, as Patricia Ferguson described it, it's an, it's an unequal process. Stage three on Climate Change uh, Act, I required two people to carry my briefing down to the front bench. It was nearly two feet high. Uh, so I think... I think those of us who have been ministers absolutely recognise what's, what, what's being said. Patricia? No, I agree entirely, but I think it was just important to get that on the record. Uh -huh. um, so. Right. Now, let, let's try and break into a, a mild canter, Gil. Well, this is a it follows on, I think, quite nicely to the points you were raising, and it's uh, would elected conveners enhance committee scrutiny of the Scottish Government? How would that work? How does, it, how does that increase just after what you, you both said? That well, you you, you know, can I, I, more I, or less I, shot this down in flames already. Yeah, I, I would say that elected conveners wouldn't necessarily enhance that process. I think more effective committees, better resource committees, and I agree with Michael again, a um, smaller number of committees able to specialise um, would, would all be able to do that. It might well be, you know, the convener has referred to um, in, in his experience um, between 2007 and 11, it might be looking at the, the balance on, on the committees as well. I think there's a whole range of things. It's not necessarily the election of the convener that would enable Parliament and its committees to do that. I, I, I'd, I'd, go, I'd just go back and quote James Mitchell again. You know, the last line of what he said in evidence to you, it would be a good base on which to look at the broader question. I think it's an opportunity to move forward, but it's not the complete answer. But without it, I don't think we'll be moving forward at all. Okay. <coughs> if if, if uh, the intention and in what the uh, presiding officer has been asking is to raise the, the profile of the conveners and their authority and in, in these small these are small committees that we work on <coughs> what actually happens to the rest of the committee where 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 does their authority does that diminish uh, if, if if authority is given to conveners conversely what happens to to, to the rest of the, My the members has always been um and, and, and michael's right this debate is, is is should be seen as part of a package but my argument has always been about making the committees more effective because the committees have a very specific job to do on behalf of Parliament. So it's about making the Parliament more effective because the committees we always regarded as almost being the cutting edge of the Parliament. It was where we uh, were going to be different from the Westminster system. We had the aspirations of the pre-legislative scrutiny. 
uh, we had aspirations for actually post-legislative uh, reflection, which frankly we've never really been able to do, and we don't have a, a second chamber um, to do that. So, in a sense, the starting point has got to be how do we help our committees to do their job on behalf of Parliament and behalf of the public? Because, you know, the funny thing is when, when, when you talk to constituents, they'll recognise that you have a, a Scottish government, that you have a First Minister, and they, they, they know that. But they actually think that Parliament is responsible for much of what the government does. And they expect us to be able to have a direct influence in things sometimes that never come near Parliament because, you know, we, those of us who have been ministers know that there will be ministerial decisions that are taken that actually do not need the consent of Parliament. And yet the public out there thinks that in some way uh, members sitting round committee tables are actually challenging and holding those government ministers to account. So they, they sometimes conflate government and, and, and Parliament. And, and my view very strongly is that for this parliament to be effective, we need strong committees. And we I come back to uh, resourcing, I come back to size. I, I, I think also come back to making sure that um, the committees have the opportunity to concentrate on the things that, that, that are important. I think you could see this. Um, you could describe this situation as having four key players in it. You have the player of our constituents, the people you know, of, of Scotland, the people in each constituency who elect us, who are essentially our bosses. So they're the most important part of it. But there's three other players in it too. There's the parties that are players, there's the, the, the parliament that's a player, and there's the government that's a player. And it's making sure that the balance between all of those is, is the right balance. And this is not new. You know, I mean, Burke was writing about this 200 years ago and looking at the balance between the players, probably the man who, who, who first identified these players and talked about the balance that they should have. And I think in, in, in the present circumstances, just where we are in the Scottish Parliament at the moment, it is, it ne it is necessary to strengthen one of those players, and that's the Parliament. And that's necessary because the Parliament is getting more powers. Uh, the Parliament has you know, 15 years experience, 16 years experience under its belt. Uh, it, it, it can look at our experience elsewhere and say, could we do things better? Uh, it spread itself a little bit too thinly in terms of the committee system, and that's probably slightly diminishing its effectiveness. So I see this reform as the elected conveners as part of a process of strengthening the Parliament. Now, the individuals involved who would be elected as conveners would have a mandate from the Parliament, so that would strengthen their action. But the committees, I think, would be refreshed by that mandate too. I don't, far from diminishing them, I think it would strengthen them because there would be an acknowledgement across the, 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 the Parliament that the Parliament itself had the role, each individual member of the Parliament had a role in selecting those conveners and deciding how the Parliament went forward with those committees. And that strengthens the role of all of us. I mean... As individuals, we actually don't influence that at the present moment. We don't tend even to influence what committees we sit on. We can vo volunteer, but sometimes we're told, no, 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 you're going somewhere else. So I think it would just strengthen the Parliament. So if you look at those four players, uh, you know, when you accept you know, our responsibility is to those who, who have elected us and to the people of Scotland, the balance between those other players, between party, between Parliament and between government, needs constantly to be reviewed and adjusted. And on this occasion, I think there are, there are a number of actions that need to be taken. But you need to start somewhere. This is on the table. This is a start that, you, that can be made. And then we can build on that start. Can I, can I just ask, and I think a brief answer will suffice. If conveners are elected, have the enhanced tenure? In other words, it's more difficult to get rid of them. So therefore, they are stronger as a result of that. Indeed. I mean, it's not impossible, you know. I mean, you can, it, but yes, it strengthens. But it strengthens the parliament as a whole, That's not just the individual yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. conveners. Yeah. Hugh? Uh, it's arguable, uh, I think. So, you know, don't, don't let it skip bog down. Margaret. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, Sir Alan B., the former House of Commons chair, told this committee that the election of committee chairs in the Commons had enhanced the authority of chairs and has given the committees a greater degree of independence. So do you believe that uh, if we were to elect conveners that that would have the same impact in this government, Parliament? I thought Alan B's evidence was very convincing. 
I have to say, I, I read it through and thought it was uh, convincing and strong. And particularly because the ability of the House of Commons to change is perhaps not as, as great as the ability of this Parliament to change. It's harder for an older institution to change. It took them quite a long time to do so. And if you look at some of the older parliaments, I, I remember paying a visit to the Canadian Parliament, where they had, had not introduced electronic voting. They talked about it for, I think, 20 years, but they hadn't actually got round to doing it. The House of Commons have talked about committee reform for, for 15 years before it actually got round to doing it, but it seems to have helped them. So I think it's one of the things that could help us to move forward. We should be mindful of what others do. I think the evidence there is interesting and good. The written evidence that the academics gave you also gave you some interesting pointers to elsewhere where other systems have been tried. I mean, the point was made that in the United States Senate, the convenership of committees uh, lay by seniority. And I think the Senate once had a senator who was 100, so presumably he, he had, to, had to chair every committee. Um, I think... Once they'd got away from that and decided they were going to do things differently, they felt, and the evidence showed, that the work of those committees improved. So I think the balance of this evidence across all the places that have done this reform is that it works for them. I see no reason why it shouldn't work here. Uh, I do think that the, the House of Commons is a, it's a very different uh, institution. Uh, and I come back to the point I made earlier on. Uh, it's much larger. Uh, it, it is more mature. Um, as Michael Russell said, they took uh, a long, t probably took as long to reflect on that change almost as our parliament has been in existence. Um, and, and yes, undoubtedly, there are things that, that we need to reflect on and we need to learn. And as we mature, uh, we need to develop and, and, and respond in, in different ways. Um, I think part of the, the change in culture, maybe not changing culture, but part of the culture that's different at Westminster is it's not just the uh, committee convener or chair that uh, has that kind of different approach and attitude. I also think that the committee members um, have a contribution to make uh, to that. And you actually see quite robust reports coming out um, from some of the Westminster committees, as indeed you have done uh, in, in, in the Scottish Parliament. But... Um, I, I think it would be wrong just to see that change purely being based on the uh, the election of the convener, as I think both of us have argued. Um, there are many other things that also need uh, to be looked at and, and, and need to be changed um, in order to make the committees more effective. And I think we, we are agreed as well, as, as indeed I suspect um, some of the committee members would agree that... Um, it's important for Parliament, for the committees, to be able to do their job properly. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Mike Russell mentioned, he gave an example of when a, an election, the deputy presiding officer, for example, he used, um, didn't actually elect the one that was expected to be elected. We see, I think you're talking about the 2011. Um, no, no, you're not. Much earlier, uh, much no, earlier right. 2001. Okay. So, Indeed. from my experience, um, electing a convener or a presiding officer or whatever, when you're just new in Parliament, and there was such a huge turnover of MSPs in 2011, for example, you didn't actually know the individuals or their uh, performance rates or at that time. So if we were then asked to elect a convener at the outset of Parliament, you know, of an administration, um, how effective would that be in that, you know, if there was a lot of new members, how would they know the actual individuals and who, so they would actually turn probably to their parties for some advice on that? Well, they may turn to wise colleagues who know the runners and riders and, and take their advice, but I don't, I don't really think that's a major objection. In every franchise, there will be some people who are well-versed in who the candidates are and what they are, and others who know nothing about them. Um, I think the reality is it's what the, inst is the institution arranges, how it arranges it, what opportunity it gives. Presumably, each candidate would want to be able to say a word or two as happens in the election of a presiding officer. I mean, you could say that the election of presiding officer would be flawed in exactly the same way, because when you were elected, you presumably didn't know any of the candidates particularly well, but each of the candidates, somebody speaks for them. Do they not? Am I right in remembering this, or do they? No? 
I don't think no. so. Yeah. Ah, right, okay, that must be for First Minister, candidate for First oh, Minister. Yeah, first minister yeah. Certainly. I think it's perfectly possible yeah. to arrange a way in which people get to know the candidates, but you know, people, there will always be new members who don't know, and they will no doubt listen. There will be people who are perhaps elected as independents who have no circle of, of friends or colleagues and will have to make a judgment from what they have heard. And do you not think that if we were to have a elected conveners, we should also then have elected committee members to have a truly independent uh, committees? It's a distinct possibility. I mean, I can't see a great argument against it. We've got to start somewhere. Maybe we've started with the elected conveners, but a different system of selecting committee members. I mean, he raised in his, in his first answer the question of whether pure de Hunt, which we use at the present moment, or pure ish de Hunt, which simply allocates the conveners according to the votes that the parties have, should be changed in some way to mirror the fact there is one committee that requires to be convened by somebody who isn't from the government party. Maybe we should look at that. That's part of the changes. Uh, but I think the point I'm making is we have to start somewhere, and this is on the table, and there is, it works elsewhere, um, and it might get us moving in looking at a lot of those other issues. I think the point Margaret McDougall makes about um, the selection of committee members, the principle would, would ultimately be the, would be the same. That if uh, you know, The convener, let, let's not kid ourselves, does have an enhanced uh, responsibility and role but you know equally um, for strong committees um, you would hope that there would ultimately be a competition of people aspiring to, to, to be on those committees so if you were to accept that principle then I suppose there's, uh, there's an argument for saying that the members would be chosen in that way as well and, and that's where I think all the problems start to come in the, the ones that are raised earlier on Okay, uh, exercising my right as I think we will allow this to go for about 20 to 25 minutes further, just to guide people in their contributions. Gil? Yeah, I think you've already answered this question, but just before... Well, you don't need to ask it again, uh, then, Gil, uh, for me. That could be a quick answer, but we've had a coalition government, we've had a minority government, now we've got a majority government. Is there any significance to that in regards to, to this? Does it make any difference? I think the convener actually suggested that, uh, that there may have been a difference in, in his experience uh, as a minister dealing with a, a committee that didn't have a, a government majority. Um, I, I, but at that time, I was on the other side of the fence. So I, I think, yes, um, that there can be differences. Um, it would be foolish to suggest that there, there wasn't. No, in the way that committees operate, not necessarily in whether or not there should be uh, the election of a convener. So, yeah, I, I, so on that point of principle, the election of a convener, just, just on that one point. Um, I don't think you should bring in reforms solely because of the political circumstances of the moment. No. They can change. I think this is something that can work in all those circumstances, and, and I think, therefore, that's why I would support it. Yeah, OK, I think you did say that, say that earlier on. Thanks, convener. Cameron. Thank you very much. Thank you. Morning. How can we make it more likely that the best candidate is selected not necessarily the party's preferred candidate. That's my point. Is it more difficult to achieve this in our small legislature? And obviously, when you elect them, you elect them by secret ballot. And would you therefore reduce the number of people on the committees? Um, not necessarily reduce the number of people on committees, because I think both of us have argued that there should be fewer committees. Uh, and in some cases, there may be an argument for actually having... Uh, larger committees, depending on uh, the specific function of of that committee. So, you know, I, I wouldn't want to be prescriptive about the uh, the size of of the committees. Um, how would you get the best person <coughs> elected? Well, you know, you know, that's the the sixty four thousand uh, dollar question. You know, you might get the best person elected, but you might not. Might there be games played? There might be. Um, I, I don't think you could give any guarantees any more than you can give guarantees with the present system. All, all I would say is that in terms of the opposition parties, they will probably try to pick the people that they think that can do the best job in holding the government to account. The government parties will look at it, I presume, from a slightly different perspective, and they'll look at people who as yet haven't been chosen to be ministers, but might have a, a contribution to make uh, 
you know, for, for, for the future. So I, I, I would anticipate that, that government and non-government um, decisions will be slightly different at the moment, but how you get the best person chosen, I think... Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, the argument that you might not have the best, best person is probably an argument against democracy rather than against elected conveners. I, I think you take your chance on, on that and see what happens. Uh, in terms of the, the wider issue, I, I think that the reality is that the election is always preferable to appointment. And I think that if that's a principle that guides politicians, they don't go far wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much. Give me this one. David? Two or three little points here. Uh, I just wonder what the members think about how um, conveners should be nominated. Should it be restricted to their own party? Should there be a um, uh, possibility of other parties being able to nominate? Should there be cross-party support or only support from the particular parties themselves? And how should, how should we um, remove a convener that we're unhappy about? What would you suggest about that? These are all matters that require, would require work by this committee were the principle accepted. But you know, at the risk of, of, of being glib, I, I mean, I would respond to, to each of them. In terms of the um, a, a removal of uh, conveners, you need to have a procedure whereby that can be done, either by the whole parliament or, or, or initiated by uh, a committee, probably by the whole parliament, and I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. In terms of nomination... Um, Certainly, as you know, Dave, uh, Mr. Thompson, in the, in the SNP, you know, people can nominate themselves to be candidates. And actually, I don't think there's much harm with that system. Uh, you know, if somebody comes to you and says, I think you'd make an extremely good con convener of such and such a committee, uh, you know, and you can say, well, I don't think it's much of an idea, or I think it is an idea, I think then you can put yourself forward. Uh, I think there is a need probably to make sure that there are candidates for each position. I mean, that's always quite difficult to do. But, you know, if you were only to have a single candidate for one position, it could either be because they're an outstanding candidate or because something's going on. So I think you need to have some checks and balances. But I don't think it's difficult. This is done elsewhere. So I think that once you accept that it should be done, I think you can draw up a, 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 an acceptable group of rules pretty quickly to make it happen. Um, and I think the whole parliament should be involved in that process, possibly with, probably, actually, with the exception of ministers. If you did decide to go down this route... Um then yes, as, as Michael Russell has said, um, you need to <coughs> look at the rules and the wherewithal um, to remove conveners. Um, I think you would need to put in safeguards um, because while you would want the committee in the parliament to be able um, to remove either an ineffective convener or someone who has behaved inappropriately, equally you would need to give that convener some protection that if that convener was doing his or her job properly and in doing so offended perhaps the government of the day or the majority party of the day, then you would need to, to be sure that that convener couldn't uh, be removed uh, on a political whim. Um, so it's not just to make it easier to get rid of someone, it's also about protecting someone who's doing their job um, effectively. Should different parties be able to nominate? Well, if you accept the, the Hunt principle that we continue, uh, if that's how we do it, on the basis of um, certain parties having access to convenerships in a certain number of committees and through that process being able to identify and agree which committees those are, then if you do move to election of conveners, then as long as um, the convener is representative of the party that's nominated for that committee, then, to be honest, I'm not sure that you should restrict the nomination um, to just people from that party, as long as whoever is nominated is from that particular party. So... Uh, you know, although I don't agree with it, if you are going to go down that route, then I, I think you would just throw the nominations open. Mm. I think it's, it, it just strikes me, I'm not at all sure what the procedure is for getting rid of a con committee convener at the present moment. I mean, I, I, I think there probably isn't one. You know, um, is there a con procedure for getting rid of a committee convener? We're, we're, we're taking advice, but I, I think the reality probably is that this you know, has not 
happened. Um, uh, and you know, there's, I, I, it's difficult to imagine circumstances in which it would happen. In fact, I can think of one circumstance, and Patricia Ferguson and I will be dredging our memories again, but I can think of one circumstance where the party attempted to remove a member from a committee, and it resulted in that member leaving that party and staying on the committee. So, you know, it does happen. On, uh, on those points, uh, um, you know, obviously things like voting systems and all that will need to be considered. But just to get the members, uh, panellists' views um, on this, if, the, if this is a good start and if we go down this road, given that what you've said about a wider range of issues that really, I think, are all linked and necessary in, in terms of we're really going to have an impact, how important is it? that we do follow through with the other issues because there will be a temptation that once we go through this and all the complications, we'll, we'll have to discuss voting systems, getting rid of conveners, all the rest of it, quite a bit of work, that it will just stop at that. And that will not do the job. I mean, how important is it that we try to build in, in our report on this, the need for the further work that then needs to take place? That will be your decision, but you know I've made it clear in my evidence. I think this is the start of a process. It would be, I think, welcome to see in your report an acceptance it was a start of the process, setting what you thought was a timetable for that process and how that process would be carried through. I, I actually think, convener, that this is probably uh, the least important of the changes that, that need to take place. Uh, I, I do think that some of the issues which Dave Thompson identifies, we as a parliament should be looking at just now anyway. And who knows, in the fullness of time, um, we might have to, to return to the election of conveners, but I think that there are far more important things that need to be uh, addressed at the moment. Uh, we've just checked the detail, and an absolute majority on the motion of a member of the committee can remove a committee convener, uh, which is quite interesting yeah. because, of course... Although Parliament elects ministers and can pass votes of no confidence, it has no mechanism by which they can be removed from office, apart from removing them from office in Parliament. And in terms of Hugh Henry's point about protection, then I would have th thought the elected convenience would be far better protected, because mm. I, I can't imagine that they would be removed except by a motion of the Parliament, mm. as opposed to a motion of the committee. So that does mean four people in this... Um, in this committee could remove a convener. I think uh, Don't better, a, um, better protection would come from a, a motion in the Parliament. George. Yes, uh, thank you, convener. Good morning. Hugh Henry's already hinted at this uh, idea, and I think Mike Russell uh, agreed, which is very unusual. You know, uh, but uh, should we go down this should, should the parties continue to allocate conveners in the present system, or should there be any other rules about party allocation of convenerships? Um, I, well, I think the Parliament needs to have a debate about how it wants its committees to operate and what the allocation of political responsibilities should be. Um, you know, I floated an idea that the Parliament might want to look at whether uh, committees other than the Public Audit Committee should actually have a convener that's a non-government, uh, from a non-government party, um, or should you have committees, certain committees where the majority on that committee um, is non-government majority, um, in order to make sure that we compensate for the lack of a, of a second chamber, if you like. Um, if you don't do that, then I suppose that, that the present system is as effective as any other if you're going to allocate the, uh, the committee responsibilities on the basis of uh, party size. The election of a government you know, is, is part of the process of a... Uh, contract with the voters in which then that government has made certain commitments which it then wants to carry through. And therefore it has a mandate to do those things. If you constructed a committee system that made that difficult or impossible to do, then I think you would be working against that general democratic rule. 
So the idea that you would allocate the convenorships by the de Haunt system to, re to, to, to recognize the balance of the parliament in order then to carry through the will of the, the electorate seems to me a sound one. Uh, and that's why it's there, that the, the parliament committees reflect the balance that the voters have chosen uh, in the election. But there is already one exception, and that is because, I think quite rightly, in terms of, of financial and audit matters, there should be another voice that should scrutinise it, because that's a scrutiny committee. I think then, we, as part of this process, it's worth having a debate. Are there any other committees in a new committee structure that might require that difference of view? But I'd just you know, be careful about trying to construct a system that goes against what voters have chosen. And the de Haunt system attempts, in terms of the convenership of the committees, to reflect the balance of the parties in the parliament. So it tries to reflect what the voters have actually done. And we should be careful about gainsaying that. Right. Um, our timekeeping is working reasonably well. Uh, and I think we've come to the end of our formal questioning. Um, let me now... Uh, as promised, give you each the opportunity to sum up or, or draw to our attention any matters you think would be of interest to us in, in the broader reform of committees, albeit our research here is focused on elected committees. Uh, Mr. Russell, first. Well, I, I think we've had a very constructive discussion of this because this is not a discrete issue and I think that uh, uh, although your inquiry is, is into that discrete issue it has opened up the need for wider reform of which I think you know uh, I think not only Hugh Henry and I are in agreement quite a number of people in the parliament in agreement that we need to make some changes now uh, over the next few months the best time to make those changes is in anticipation of the election of a new parliament because then they can come into effect at the start of that new parliament it's harder to do it during a parliamentary session so I would have hoped that uh, the committee would be committed to that process of reform. Uh, whether or not it's committed to elected conveners is another matter. I, I do go back to the point I started with. I think James Mitchell is right about this. Uh, this is the start of a process. You have to start somewhere. I think it shows willing. It doesn't stop you doing other things. It might just actually drive you forward to do other things. But I'd certainly like to see your report committed to a, a, a wider, longer process that results in necessary changes uh, for the start of the, the parliament that will be elected a year from now. Mr Henry. Thank you, convener. Um, I agree with Michael Russell that what we, need, we do need to consider is that wider reform. Um, I, I think it would be a mistake if we simply uh, focused on this one issue, which, as I said earlier on, I don't think necessarily is the, the, the most important one. Um, so, you know, I'm up for change. I have been arguing for change for a number of years, and I think it's in the interests of uh, this Parliament to, to have a debate about change. Look, uh, may I thank you both uh, very much for uh, giving you the time and being good quality interaction with, uh, with the committee. And I think you've done what good... Uh, panels do, you've left us with more questions than we had at the outset, uh, which is a pretty good place to start. So thank you once again for giving you the time. Thank you. Right, colleagues, the third item on our agenda is for the committee to approve its annual report. Uh, the committee is required to produce a report each year under Standing Order Rule 12.9. Uh, you have our draft report in front of you. Uh, do members have any uh, comments they wish to make in relation to the report? Patricia. I know, I know. You know me so well, convener. Um, I'm, I'm very content with the report as it stands, but I just wondered, uh, at paragraph 5, we um, obviously published our report about lobbying yep. and that has gone to the government and the government's thinking about that. But I just wondered whether we're going to have a debate on that. I know there was one at the beginning, but I just wondered whether we'd have a debate on that report at any time. Did we have the debate after the report? No, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, I, I, I think we are masters of our own destiny in this regard, but I think, I think uh, the, the position we're now in, we're really waiting for a formal response from the government. We haven't as yet had that. We've had an indication that it's not arriving as promptly as it sometimes does. But we know that that's because they're preparing 
uh, to legislate on the matter. And I think the next step is to, uh, to see what our response is to the government's plans. Uh, we, we, we could clearly uh, decide that that's the legislation the, the government will consult on its proposals. Uh, we, of course, have in essence done pre-legislative scrutiny, except we haven't seen the legislation. Uh, so I, th I, think, I think we're probably expecting to see something from the government, certainly before recess, and I think the indications are rather sooner than that. Uh, so I think the, the next step is to wait for that to happen. Is, but, but I'm in the hands of the committee, that's my understanding. You know, just in the normal course of events, we prepare a mm. report, sent to government, get the comments, and we have a debate at some point. Um, and I know, as I say, there was a debate at the beginning of the yeah. process, but um, it, it, it might, before government comes with its ideas in the form of legislation, it might just be a good idea to have Parliament reflect on what the committee is saying about all of that. But, I'm, well, well, I, you know, I'm not desperate to do that. No, without giving you false certainty, I think the response from the government will be on a time scale that doesn't leave us that opportunity. All ah, right, OK. But I think we will provide our response to the government uh, on the back of what they bring forward before recess. I'm in your hands on that matter, but I think mm. that's where we should certainly, certainly go. And, of course, we are going to, provided the Bureau agrees, be the committee that will take any legislation that's brought forward through. Um, I would be astonished if it was any other committee, yeah. but it is not, okay. it's not our call. Okay. All right, that's, that's by Philip Proper. Is there anything else anyone wishes to deal with on this? No? Uh, oh, oh, right, okay, uh, so you're content for the, uh, the report to be submitted in the form that's before us in draft. That's, that's, that's helpful. Now, I am looking at time, and I'm, I'm quite uh, anxious that agenda item five, which we need to consider in a very precise and formal way, uh, that we do deal with that today. So I'm going to propose that we take the code of conduct at our next meeting. Is, is everyone content with that? Right, okay, that, that's helpful. In that case, I move the meeting into private session. Thank you.